Hey guys, uh, like I promised you earlier, I do have a visitor on the farm from K-State. I have Dr. Raymond Cloyd with us today. So I'm just gonna kind of hand it over to him. It's just gonna be kind of a generic q and I'm just gonna kind of ask him some stuff, get his opinions on things. So it's great to have an expert here on the farm today. So um, Raymond, you just tell me a little bit about yourself and what you do for K-State. Yeah, yeah, Tracy, uh, I'm the horticulture entomologist. I have a 70% extension, 30% research appointment. I've been at Kansas State for almost over 20 years. And I, my responsibilities are horticultural entomology, and that includes greenhouse, nursery, turf grass, interscape, conservatory, oh, wow. Christmas trees, fruits and vegetables, cannabis, hemp, and, and pollinators. So uh, my goal for, is to help producers, in, mostly in regards to plant protection or pest management, minimizing or alleviating problems with insect and mite pests on the, on the various crops. Okay, so like I was explaining to you earlier, um, how did this happen? <laughs> or... or I've never really noticed a problem with thrips, and that seems to be what, what what the issue is. And that's how this all started was is I noticed some issues with stuff. I reached out to a couple experts. They put me um, in, in your back pocket and said, hey, this is who you need to get a hold of. This is who you need to talk to. They will help you uh, try to help you work through this issue. And so how, how would this have happened um, in a designated insect-free zone, pretty much how I look at it as uh, something that I've been growing in for the last couple years. Okay, I think it, you and I talked about that earlier, is you brought those plants out <clears throat> from the, uh, the seed bed and you put them out here. Now, one of the issues we have is you've got, you do have some insect screening. The problem is that insect screening, the mesh size, still, uh, thrips can still go through that. So if you have weeds outside the area, they'll move in because the salad is like a buffet to them and they'll start feeding. So uh, really, my hypothesis is, Tracy, that they came in through that screening, you potted them up, they built up this population, and all of a sudden you noticed the feeding damage and the poop, drips poop on the plants. Okay, so, so saying that, how do I take care of this going? Is this something that's always going to be a hinder in my back pocket from now on since... Since in 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 when I got that email, it was a little. I, I have to show you guys that email. When I got that email, it's pretty disturbing to me. When I read it, it um and and I appreciate the uh, the kind of to the point kind of thing. It was like a serious infestation infestation, infestation yes. of thrip damage, yes. and I was thinking to myself, so apocalyptic. Is what I could, all I could think of was in my head was like, holy cow, how. How did I not see this? Am I not being a good enough gardener? And am I not being cleanly? You know, I try to pride myself on the way our high cones look, how weed free they are, how clean they are, clean of plant debris, of clutter, uh, tools, anything like that. And, and then to hear that, it's almost like it kind of it, it kind of put me on a little depression there for, for a couple of days. I kind of just kind of slumped around a little bit thinking, well, I did this, you know, and, and, and is it something that I did? that would, would cause this, or, or is it more nature, or just happens every day and people just don't notice it? Well, you went nine yards, but you didn't go in for the touchdown, <laughs> Tracy. And the one thing you're missing was the scouting aspect. When you put your plants out, you need to do scouting. That can be using your little sticky cards, visual inspections for those insects and mites that can't fly. But if you had put some yellow sticky cards just above your lettuce crop, you would have detected those adults, and that would have told you, I need to do something, whether spray with a like spinosad or, or or do some other aspect of, the, of what we call the plant protection uh, pest management. That would alleviate the damage or the plants that I saw. How severe they how, were. They, they had this heavy infestation. Yeah. Okay, so so everything. So it's all proactive. If you and the old adage is, the more you do on the front end, the less you do have to do on the back end. So if, after you planted, you put yellow sticky cards or even put some some yellow sticky tape to mass trap them. That would alleviate the the infestation you had. Okay, and that's something I've never done. You guys know from the prior video and stuff, I do have cards out here now. Your thought process, you told me, hey, I need you to go get some sticky cards. Mm -hmm. I need you to put them out for three, four days. And then when I show up, we'll see what we've collected. And I promise we will get down and, and we'll see what we've collected. Yeah. Um, so this is probably something I need to be doing on year round then. I probably need to be more proactive on like items like this, like having sticky cards out. Um, especially in high tunnel areas, I guess, because I'm pretty much, this is its own culture in here. You know, I'm kind of separated from the outside pretty much. Um, so I probably need to be a little more, and I thought I was, you know, I mean, in my head, I thought I was by, 
by having nice weeded beds, by having clean pathways, by having, you know, drip irrigation, not overhead watering, by having all that stuff. So there are always things to think about, guys. Um, even something as simple as, you know, $20 worth of sticky cards, you know, maybe, maybe I would have saw this two months ago. No, you know, and I would have noticed it. You no, know, you're doing everything right, Tracy. I mean, you want to remove weeds because weeds will harbor the insects and also the, the reservoirs for the viruses that drips, aphids, and wildflies will transmit. So you're doing all you're doing, but it's more holistic. So in addition to like you're uh, keeping the weeds down, keeping the beds down, and you, you still have to scout. Scouting. Okay. If you're not scouting, you're going down the road with, with blinders on. Okay. You have no idea the trends and patterns that are happening in your in your poop house throughout the year. Also, you have to do the visual inspections, like for aphids, because they're not going to be caught on the yellow sticky cards. So you have to do two types of scouting: is active, going out looking at your plants for mites and aphids that are not captured on the yellow sticky cards, and you're going to do the passive, where you put you know, these yellow sticky traps out there that captures adult white flies and thrips okay. and, and fungus that the the, the 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 winged individuals that they'll be attracted to it. So it, it's a holistic strategy, and. Uh, you know, just scouting is a part of that. You know, it's cultural, physical, mechanical, chemical, and biological. That, that's, that's great to know. I, yeah. I never even, and, and just for instance, like, like you guys know, we talk about when we built these high tunnels, you know, about using insect netting on the side, trying to keep uh, hornworms out, any type of army worms. Last year, army worms were terrible for us. Um, last year, we didn't have any insect netting on here. What I actually had, to be honest, was deer netting. And I use the deer netting to keep snakes, uh, any type of raccoons, dogs, Burn cats, yeah. anything that would try to come in here. Um, and this house was full of tomatoes last year, and we had a lot of hornworms. And so, you know, I would pick them off. You know, it's like anybody else does. You know, you spray for them if you want to. You could naturally, it's easy to pick a hornworm off. But they do a lot of damage. They do. Um, but, you know, you could come in here in 10 minutes with a podcast. I, I could pick a couple hundred hornworms out of here. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to get some insect netting. I'm going to put insect netting on the side, and you know what? I will never have any other insect issues ever in my high tunnels going forward. And so this is the first year in both the tunnels that we've had insect netting. And I did what most people did. Um, I got online. Um, I bought the best insect netting I could afford. And I went through, I won't say what the company is, but I went through a national brand company um, that sells insect nettings, that sells... Um, all silage tarps, they sell, I mean, that's what they do for a living. They sell this kind of guard. And I bought high-end insect netting, you know, and, and I think, to be honest, I think it's, I think it was eight foot by a hundred foot roll cost me like a hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I spent good money on it. It's not like I went to Amazon and bought the cheapest insect netting I could buy right. and put on here. I actually spent good money, you know, on, on this stuff. So I thought a couple hundred dollar investment for both tunnels was going to keep me insect free. And you brought up some stuff about insect netting that I was unaware of. And I'm sure a lot of you are unaware. Could you, could you kind of explain that a little bit? Yeah, what the insect netting is designed to do, you mentioned like cat, uh, hornworms, is to keep the adult stages from moving in. The, the females would lay the eggs on the plants. The larva would emerge, and that's when you'd get tomato hornworms and fall armyworm and these other caterpillars. But there are there are various types of these we call insect screening. There is insect screening. There's antiviral screening. And the difference is, is the mesh size. So for thrips, we want to use the antiviral screening because it keeps the, because they're about two, mil, two millimeters long and they're very narrow. Mm -hmm. They can squeeze through the netting. So you want if you're having problems with thrips then you want the antiviral screening. Now, the downside of that is it restricts the air movement. So it's going to get warmer, and you may have to have more fans, horizontal airflow fans, but that will keep the trips out and keep everything out at that point. Because So what I need to be asking is, like, like or for all of us, what we need to be asking is, hey, is this an antiviral um, type of insect netting? So right. we know for sure what we're spending our money on. You know, I just assumed... Insect netting is insect netting, and I was going to be safe. No, no. They, they come in various mesh sizes. You can get ones that restrict, like, white flies and aphids, but uh, it'll still allow thrips to come through. So if you really want to restrict thrips, which vector viruses, and that's why they call it the antiviral screening, you want that antiviral screening because the mesh size is such it'll keep the thrips. It'll restrict the thrips or exclude them from coming into your your your, uh, your operation. So you always learn something new here, guys. Always learn something new. All right. Um... I guess let's get down and dirty and check out some of these cards. 
Yeah, and can can I explain what this yes. is for? Yes. Uh, what what Tracy's doing is I recommend this is he's uh, putting sticky cards just above the surface of the growing media, and what he's doing is finding out what insects will come out of the soil. In Western flower, flower thrips pupates in, in the growing medium and soil. So when the adults come out, they will get captured in the old sticky cards, and you'll know if you've got thrips actually uh, inhabiting or residing in in the soil or growing medium. So this is this is a an idea I think that many uh, producers should implement if they're dealing with insects that actually have a life stage that is in the soil. Okay, so what we're looking for are there, you, you catch various insects that are on here, even, even non insects like springtails, and uh, we're looking for thrips. And this card doesn't have any, which means that there's nothing coming out of the soil, in this case, overwintering. But we've got, like, you know, uh, maybe fungus and adults uh, that'll emerge because the fungus and adult larvae and most of the life stage is in the soil. So this gives you a, <clears throat> the key of scouting is early detection. And this gives you an idea of what maybe to expect later on. But this card really doesn't have any insects that we would consider problematic. Springtails are not a major pest. Uh, many of these insects on here would not be of a concern to any of your, your crops that you're growing in a hoop house or any type of a greenhouse related, in, in, we call indoor environment. Okay, so should we check out a couple other cards and see if maybe, because um, this house here, like I was explaining to you earlier, this is the one that I had three 65 foot beds of Salanova and head lettuce mm -hmm. in. So we had 1,200 heads of lettuce in this, and this is the house that I lost everything in. Yeah, I mean, what we're seeing mostly is just parasitoids that'll come in naturally, but um, really we're not seeing any thrips, which is good, indicating that they're not, they're, they're, they haven't had a life stage that's been in the soil and then emerging as an adult. Okay, so I literally just pulled all this lettuce out of here about two weeks ago. And those are the samples that I sent, that I brought to you, that you that you looked at. So where did they all go? Did they? And when I pulled them out of this tunnel, did they go with them? Like when I when I because I took all that lettuce up to a burn pile that I always burn all my squash and tomato mm -hmm. debris and stuff in, and I burned them. So did were they on that lettuce when I transported them out there, and got, that's where the majority of them went, or did they crawl back into the soil possibly, or or did they? go back through the netting and find something else to eat? And why are they not on my green beans and my basil? Well, let's go back to the fundamentals of the biology of the life cycle of the thrips. The females lay the eggs in, in plant tissues. The, the, the larvae emerge from the eggs and there are two larval end stars. The second end star then goes to the bottom of the plant and, and enters the soil. And then you have two pupil stages and then they come out as an adult. So to answer your question, Trace, is when you took everything out of here, uh, you took the larvae and adults with them because those are the samples. I got some samples and I found larvae and, and some adults on those lettuce samples. So uh, the fact is that we, you're not getting anything on the cards indicates that the second instar larva did not enter the soil so when you took these plants out you took like larvae and adults on there and that disrupted the life cycle so that was good that, that, that's a good right thing, you, yeah yeah one 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 aspect of thing is if you've got a heavy infestation rogue out the plants and remove them now we recommend you know if you have a lar uh, an operation with a lot of plants in there put them in bags because if you're moving them through your greenhouse they could come off and, and, and get on your beans and some other plants that are in your in, in your in your structure and they'll start an infestation all right so we're in what i call the big tunnel it's a 20 by 100 um i put this tunnel up last fall uh for this year's growing season knowing that i wanted to upgrade growing um, a lot of lettuces and stuff like that going into our our uh, season here you can see it's pretty play, uh, plain in here um just to kind of explain to you i've had a lot of damage um and not so much insect damage um that whole back area there was all determinate tomatoes uh, less than a month ago. And I lost all of them to heat stress. Um, even though I do have shade cloth on these tunnels, um, I, I lost everything. So we're literally talking about thousands of pounds of tomatoes that I lost, which is fine. You know, that's going to happen. You're going to lose crops and stuff. That's all part of the game here. But it's a, it's a financial hit to your wallet when you're a small market farmer like I am. Um, but... Overall, looking at what I do have in here, I do have some peppers in here. Of course, there's, you know, I notice there are a little bit of aphids on here. Um, I do spray this once a week in here, um, but I don't get crazy. A lot of times it's me just kind of shaking them off. Um, but is that something I should be worried about spreading to other things in here or possibly taking over? Or, or what I'm doing, just trying to be a little not proactive. 
So that's a ladybug there. Ladybug larva. Ladybug larva. Yeah, yeah. Let me grab the camera yeah. real quick and we'll show that. So what you're looking at there is this. So that's ladybug larva there. Yes. So the reason why that ladybug larva is there is because you have aphids. we have aphids yeah. on the leaves here, yeah. which you guys can see. Yeah, you have aphids here, and the late the and right here are molting skins of the of the ladybug of the aphids as they shed their skin. They go through be called molting or dysis. And you know this is a when you see a lot of that, and you see this if you see this uh, this kind of a glaze material here, Correct. that's sticky honeydew. And as aphids feed, they exude it out their back end. And sticky honeydew is uh, a, a great growing medium for black city mold. Black city mold. Oh. So really, so so really, this this you, you want to be out here monitoring, scouting, because aphids in a greenhouse or a hoop house don't have to mate to reproduce. All of them are female, and they're all clones of each other. So this one ladybug, though, uh, larva, will not will not manage all those aphids. Yeah. Okay. So, so so what you're doing? So you can use you can use like a, a hard force of water spray. You can use potassium salt to fatty acids, insecticidal soap, or some type of mineral oil to kill them. Yeah. But remember, you want to make sure your plants are water irrigated the night before, and you want to apply them in the early morning or late in the evening because in the heat of the day, you can burn your plants. Okay, so you always want to make sure, and see, that's something I didn't know also, is you always want to water them really good the night before right. you spray. You don't want them water stressed in any place, Tracy, because that, that will lead to potential we call phytotoxicity or plant damage. Okay, see, that's something good to know because that's something I did not know. Mm -hmm. And so that's, so now, see, it's one of those guys we always talk about tools in your toolbox. This is a great tool for your toolboxes to remember that. So aphids is all you see. You don't see any type of anything else that could be causing like, any thrips or anything? No, I don't see thrips. Mostly it's, it's mostly, mostly it's aphids. aphids. Yeah, yeah. So you can see uh, this. So you can see the, the that, that glaze, that sticky we call honeydew. And a couple of, you can see a little bit of molting skins, and that's from when aphids molt. Uh, they shed their old skin off as they develop, yeah. Okay, so I do have, you know, I do have some carrots in here, which which I think look okay. Yeah. Um, now the cucumbers, did you notice anything with the cucumbers? These have been in here for two weeks. Yeah, so what I'm looking, the, only, the major insect on these would be aphids. You know, that's why, but remember, when you're dealing with insects and mites, everything is on the leaf underside. So you have to look on the leaf underside because they don't like UV sunlight, especially this time of year when you're, you, the sun is high on the horizon, the days are longer. So you have to look on the leaf undersides. And if you're going to spray with any insecticide or miticide, you have to get on leaf undersides because you need to get thorough coverage. And most of the materials out there have very short residual or persistence. And that means you may have to spray maybe twice a week, but you, the coverage is critical in getting high mortality or kill of your, your targeted insect or mite pest. We are in my back room here, and I just kind of wanted to show um, what the stuff that I have here on the farm that we use, um, and just kind of get your ideas about it. And if I'm using the correct items, or am I using something incorrectly, or, or not what it's for, I'm just kind of curious on, on an expert side to tell me if this is what I'm using is what I need to be using or should there be something else I should be looking into. Mm -hmm. um, so pretty much, you know, we kind of kind of stuck everything up here. So let's first of all, let's start with the easy one. This is just basically just Monterey horticulture, basically just mineral oil. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you think about mineral oil for use, like what, for what I'm using? It for? Yeah, mineral oil, uh, all oils are suffocants, Tracy. And so you spray them, they cover the breathing pores of the insect. They also, the benefit is they kill eggs by suffocation. So oh, okay. the, their contact, very minimal residual, but the bottom line is their only contact, so thorough coverage of all plant parts, especially fundercides, is critical. Because if you just spray the top, you're going to get no mortality, or you're not going to kill anything. You have to get in the leaf underside. Okay, yeah. so so for sure, we've always been told um, to make sure that we get underneath the leaves, so that's what you're talking about. So that's something we need to But right. mineral oil is pretty good. I, this, is, this is good for me. Then. Mineral oil mm -hmm. is a very broad-spectrum material. It'll kill beneficials. But it doesn't last as long as other materials out there. Okay, so let's go on to the next one that I've used. This is looks like pyrethrin, and it's more of like your orchard spray. Yeah, well, it's got two active ingredients. Sulfur is a miticide and a fungicide. It's been used for a long time for powdery mildew. Sulfur is a miticide, but pyrethrin is a plant-derived material. We call them botanicals. It is derived from the chrysanthemum flower, Tanacetum cinerary folium. It's one of our oldest materials. They grind them up in wet uh, a, a white powder, and it's used for for killing aphids and a lot of soft-bodied insects, not so much caterpillars and beetles. But the issue is, again, thorough coverage of all plant parts. And one of the downsides of pyrethrins 
is it doesn't last long in the environment. You spray it in an hour, it's all good. But most critically, you gotta get thorough coverage of all plant parts because it has very little residual activity of persistence, which means that you got to probably spray it again. Okay, so it's the same as what the mineral oil would be. So if any time it rains or anything, or is there, you were mentioning something earlier that I didn't know about being with the, the UV and stuff on that. Yeah, uh, the pyrethrins are very susceptible to UV light degradation. So if you apply it and it's a lot of sunlight, it can be broken down within an hour. So it doesn't, that's really, it doesn't last long, very, very short residual activity. So that's the reason why you should probably be spraying this towards more towards late afternoon, early evening. Or early why, in the morning. Or early in the morning. Early in so. the morning or late in the evening because during the sun, during the, the heat of the day or when the sun's out, it's going to be broken down by UV sunlight. Okay, so that's something you want to make sure that you water your plants really deep good yes. the night before and then use this either in the morning or, or later that night. Late evening. Okay, so those two things are working, right? That's that stuff that I should be using. Yes, that, that I'm good those with. are fine, yeah. Okay, so I've got some garden inspect spray here. It looks like it's Spinosad. Is that something we should be using? Spinosad is a, uh, it's a sort of a, like a bacteria, but it's really good against three types of insects, caterpillars, thrips, and leaf miners. That's what, it, so for, for your thrips on your lettuce, Tracy, that would have been something you can use early on. You okay. can also use for caterpillars. It works on most caterpillars. I use them on hornworms, when tomato hornworms is what I've been well, using. Well, when they is get that... too big, it's too late. You know, it's oh, a, okay. It's, what it is is a stomach poison, which means the insect has to eat it to be effective. But it's very good on thrips, caterpillars, and leaf miners, which get in the leaf tissues. So, okay, so that's something I should probably be looking into having on hand then. Yeah, for, my, for, for, for thrips how much and caterpillars. Yes. Yeah. Okay, and then we have, also we have neem oil. We were talking about that earlier. Um, can you explain the differences maybe between that and and just just good old fashioned okay. horticultural oil? Neem oil, uh, neem oil is derived from the plant called Azadiracta indica. It's the neem plant. And basically uh, it's extracted from the seeds and the active is clarified hydrophobic extract of neem oil. It is just like most oils is a suffocate, however, it doesn't last as long because it's a botanical, just like pyrethrins. So most of your botanicals uh, don't have the residual activity as your synthetic or other materials out there, but it will smother the eggs, kill larvae, nymphs, and the adults, uh, just like your typical mineral oil. Would. Okay, so what we were talking about, what I was bringing to your attention, we were talking about earlier is for what you use here on horticultural oil or mineral oil, and then neem oil, this literally, is a better deal. Like neem oil is like crazy expensive compared to buying a bigger bottle of or well, probably 50% more expensive yeah. or 100% more expensive. Depending, I think this bottle of neem oil was like 12 bucks and I think this was like $4. Yeah. <laughs> well, you have to look at the concentration of the active, Tracy. This has got 70% active and this has got 80% active. So yes, you want to go with the horticultural oil or the mineral oil. Okay, so that's good to know. Yeah. Um, and the other thing we have here, we were talking about since we were talking about um, this permethrin. You were explaining to me the difference between this one. Oh, that's the spinosad one. That one there is pyrethrin, and this one here is permethrin. What's the what's the difference between the two bottles, or what are they about? Okay, the major difference is that pyrethrin is the natural botanical from the plant. Permethrin is a synthetic derivative. We call these pyrethroids. Uh, permethrin uh, is longer lasting uh, in the environment. You, you use it in your mosquito, you use it for mosquito repellent. You don't apply it in your skin, uh, but it's a broad spectrum insecticide. It just lasts longer than the permethrin, than pyrethrins is because it's synthetically derived. So the permethrin is man-made. Synthetic. Yes. Synthetic. Yeah. And so if you were trying to be, which I'm, you know, we've talked about in the past, I'm not organically certified here. So um, I don't like, you know, I like to practice as organic as possible. So this is something, if you were an organic farm, you could not use this at all then. No, but you could use it for your Japanese beetles feeding on the elm because you're, you're, you're not going to harvest that or feed on it, but that would kill the Japanese beetle adults. Too. Okay. So that's something good to have just to try to kill those Japanese yeah. beetles. Then. Yeah. Okay. So what we'll do guys is, um, we're going to uh, go back outside and then uh, we'll kind of wrap this up. So I think that's going to be uh, a lot for us today. Um, but so what I did want to just talk about a little bit is to just kind of go over a couple things. So with my, I, I know I keep jumping back to the thrip problem. It, it sticks in my mind because it, it's just something with me. So 
basically doing what I'm doing right now, trying to be as proactive as possible now that I know that there is an issue or a possible issue going on. So the yellow sticky cards, uh, stuff like that, is there anything else I can do besides just, just hands-on leaves or, or would you suggest changing that insect netting out to a different quality of insect netting to try to help me with that in the future? Or do you think that would be more harmful with the wind, like you were talking about, it's less wind that gets to come in because it's a smaller mesh. Well, what what are your thoughts about that? Well, Tracy, I really don't think uh, there's any rationale to remove the netting. I mean, you're keeping most everything out. But what I do recommend is putting some yellow sticky cards on stakes and putting them right outside the netting to see if you are getting them come in. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah. So actually putting them outside of the high yeah. tunnel to see, and if we notice those cards have a lot of thrips on them then we know okay well they're coming from the right. outside now yeah. so you do know where they're coming from so. yeah Give oh. you, again early <clears throat> detection and that's you know you can put like maybe three on each side put them on stakes and that way if you do start if you catch them you know they're coming in and to be aware that you know they could be inside your crop if you're lettuce if you're going lettuce again and uh just be aware again the more you do in the front end the less you do in the back end but the more proactive you are the more options you have in dealing with this insect and my pest when you do have a minor infestation. Okay, so like in these tunnels, like I always try to, I, I always talk about to people is your most expensive piece of real estate on your farm is going to be high tunnel ground. Um, you know, you don't make any money from grass, of course. So grass is basically, you know, worthless as, as a farming wise. Um, you have outside beds, of course, which we do, and then I have tunnel beds. So I always look at my tunnel as the most expensive piece of real estate because it, it basically is. It's like being on the beach in Miami versus being in Western Kansas somewhere, you know, for, for lack of a better term. But <clears throat> I grow a lot of lettuce in that high tunnel. Now, should I have a better, now would a better rotation would have helped me on that possibly? Because I do, I'm very bad at rotating the lettuces in the high tunnel because I've only got two. So they've got to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. So I tend to try to maximize that space. now. Would rotation have helped me with this? Like if I would have made that a cucumber tunnel this year or a uh, tomato tunnel or something like that? Or, or is rotation really that, that, that prominent that we really need to be thinking about that? You know, that's a very good question and I'm really not sure that rotating would have benefited you at all inside the, you know, inside the, the hoop house uh, or the high tunnel. I mean, the fact is thrips, thrips probably came in, established on your lettuce and then built the populations and you noticed them probably too late unfortunately in this case um i i would really just say just keep growing the the lettuce but be more proactive on your ipm or your plant protection strategies to minimize the prospects of having another infestation like you had this year like the sticky cards um doing a little more turn the leaves over yeah. checking things out yeah um asking people questions <laughs> that that's probably a bad one for me is i, I don't reach out a lot um, but you always want to make sure, number one, your audience needs to be sure is identify the problem first. In, 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 what an insect is, what mite is, because that will allow you to determine, okay, what's the life cycle, what's the potential damage, what's the potential direct and indirect damage, does this one vector viruses, which may, means the concern is much greater. So really, insect identification or insect and mite pest identification is critical in dealing with these in, in the future. And that's part of your management strategy. If you know it's thrips, then you know the life cycle and you know what options you have in minimizing an infestation for next crop or for next year. Okay, that's great. Well, I want to thank you for being, for hanging out with me the last couple hours and uh, it's a plethora of knowledge. I'll tell you that you've basically, um, you've kind of flipped me upside down here. Now, now, you know, there's a lot of things that I never would have even thought of or didn't even think or didn't even know. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the, the thing is like we always talk about is that, you know, there's no set book on gardening. There's no set book on being a market gardener, or being a backyard gardener, or being a commercial gardener. Um, you can try to pull little pieces of information from people to um, to try to steer yourself in the right direction. But until you actually sit down and talk to somebody that's an expert in their field um, to, to explain it to you, um, it, it, it makes a big difference. And so there's a lot of things I learned today, you know, that, um, that kind of just, uh, I was unaware of and and that's why we try to bring content like this to you guys and that was the whole purpose of this uh, series is to uh, bring people to your front door to your TV screens that you guys don't maybe not get the chance to talk to so I do appreciate you coming to the farm today yeah, thank you very much yeah. for being here um, guys as always 
Um, be safe, be kind, and uh, make sure you get your hands dirty, and I'll talk to you guys next week.